Good evening. Welcome to Emmanuel Assembly of God. My name is Pastor Ken, and tonight we're going to study Lesson 3, The Armor of God. Now, if you want to see uh, the notes, click on Notes below right here, and the notes will pop up below. And then if you want to fill them in as we move through the lesson, then go sign in with Facebook ID and come back and you'll be able to fill those in. So let's get ready. Get your tools, get your Bible and your pen, your notebook, get your lesson, and you probably want your coffee. Lesson three, the breastplate of righteousness. Now, last week, we started with the pieces of the armor of God with truth. And if we are going to move through the armor of God and we're going to move through our walk with the Lord, we must begin with truth. Without truth, nothing else matters. And so that's why this is so very important that we begin with truth. And so as we look at tonight's lesson, I want us to think about the importance of that piece of armor that is called the second piece of armor is the breastplate of righteousness. And that is in our lesson. If you've been following along, we're in Ephesians chapter 6. So as we look at the importance of the breastplate, uh, I've pulled out a lesson from the Old Testament, one of the kings of Israel's, not a very good king. King Ahab, he wanted Naboth's vineyard. And Naboth's vineyard was near the king's palace. And Naboth's vineyard was beautiful and just wonderful to look at. And the uh, grapes, all of that was just wonderful. And the Tenth Commandment, thou shalt not covet meant nothing to King Ahab. He wanted Naboth's vineyard. And being king, he thought that being king, he could get whatever he wanted. And so he approached Naboth and asked him to sell him the vineyard. Well, Naboth would not sell his vineyard. Now, this is not that he did not want to please the king. This is not like today how that, you know, people buy and sell property like crazy, okay? Uh, one of our uh, favorite things to watch on TV are those people who will buy something, they'll make modifications to it, fix it up, and then they will uh, resell it. And so... Uh, this is not that situation where someone is looking uh, just to, uh, to buy and sell. Uh, in Israel's history, the land was everything to them. The land, they were tied to the land, and a family, their genealogy could be traced back to the land. And so that was all that Naboth had from, from his father and to give to his children. And so he wasn't going to sell it. Now, it was his to sell if he wanted to, but also it was his right. It was a God-given right from the day that they settled that area that they could keep their piece of possession, their land. Now, when... Uh, in the course of our lesson, with me, as we look at the importance of the breastplate, uh, King Ahab's wife was not a Jew. Uh, she uh, was a Seraphonician king's daughter. And uh, you know her by the name of Jezebel. And Ahab allowed Jezebel to take control of that situation. And so he came home after not getting the vineyard and he began to sulk. And Jezebel looked at him and said, what is the matter with you? And he told her and she said, oh, you stop your fussing. And she said, I'll take care of it. Well, she began to spread rumors about Naboth. And people believed the rumors 
and Naboth was stoned. When he was killed, then Ahab went and took possession of the vineyard. So that's the backdrop of this lesson on the uh, breastplate. Later on, in the next chapter, there was a battle. And Ahab went out to battle. And instead of him staying in his place of being king and staying back, staying with the royal chariot and all of his guards and everything, Ahab disguised himself as a regular soldier. And he was moving uh, not on the front line, but he was back quite a ways, and he was uh, seeing how the battle was going. And as the battle was ensuing, a soldier on the other side just randomly shot into the Israelite army. And that random arrow struck King Ahab in between the sections of his armor. Okay, So that armor, metal breastplate and the shoulder parts, uh, it, in order to be able to move, then it had a section. And that arrow came in at the right section and pierced his uh, chest. And later on that day, the king died from his wound. And so we're looking at the importance of the breastplate. Uh, putting it on and wearing it. Uh, but just the breastplate by itself was not going to uh, protect Ahab. And so we're going to look at the breastplate with the idea of the breastplate being the righteousness of God. So just as the picture last week of the truth encircling the soldier's body, and holding everything together in place, we're looking this morning, this evening, at the chest uh, protector, that breastplate that would, you know, would have metal plates around and even in the back. And uh, so when we put on the armor of God, we're going to be able to face the hordes of Satan. And so you must dress yourself for battle. I can't dress you. I can't make you put on the belt of truth. I can't make you put on the righteousness of God. I can't do it for you. You have to do it yourself. Now, you do your best to defend yourself. In other words, you hold on to truth and you hold on to the breastplate of righteousness. You hold on to God's truth. You hold on to God's righteousness. Now, with all of our efforts, the enemy gets through your defenses and he hits the breastplate. Now, unlike Ahab, with God, there is no break in the armor. Okay, We just used the illustration before to show you how important that breastplate was. The enemy gets through your defenses Okay, and he hits the breastplate. You may have thought yourself a goner. You may have thought yourself done. But because the enemy hits the breastplate of righteousness, then you re-engage the battle because it doesn't do you in. Just like the belt of truth is not your truth, it's not my truth, it's not our truth. It is God's truth. So the breastplate of righteousness is not your righteousness or my righteousness or the church's righteousness. It is God's righteousness. And so we put on God's armor, God's way. So we ask the question and we'll answer this question as we move through our lesson. What purpose does the breastplate serve? And I think you're getting the a pretty good picture of its importance. The breastplate was a vital part of the Roman soldier's armor. Now, when we say breastplate, it's not just some little tiny uh, piece of metal, all right? It's, it is a piece of armor that 
you know, covers the torso and around the sides and around the back so that you are uh, protected. It provides protection for the torso, for the abdomen. And you know that inside here are vital organs. And if uh, an enemy's dart or an enemy's arrow, if it gets through into the abdomen, you know it. Uh, yeah, without that protection, a bre without a breastplate, a soldier would be asking for death. Any attack, whether a sword or an arrow or even from a slingshot, a, 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 a stone, a dart, any attack, even, even the blow from a fish, uh, from a fish, from a fist, sorry about not a fish, uh, any attack could instantly become fatal. Uh, you know that people have died before from a blow to the chest. You, you hit someone just right in your solar plexus here and it can cause uh, uh, your, a, your, your heart to stop. You get a, a kidney punch. You can cause an, a, an organ to rupture and you could bleed to death. So the breastplate can make some attacks ineffective. So if it's from a lance or from an uh, arrow or any of these things, we talked about a sword, the breastplate can cause that blant, blant, that blow to just glance off and it will be ineffective. Now, I'm going to give us some scriptures to show how that God's righteousness is critical to us. Wealth is worthless, question number four. Wealth is worthless in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. Now, this is not saying that wealth or money doesn't have its place. But the day of wrath is a place, it is a, a set time that one day we will stand before the Lord. So that's what we know as the day of wrath or judgment day when we'll stand before God. And so all of our money, all of our wealth, all of our possessions, all of our land, all of our whatever we have, at that moment, it's going to be worthless when we stand before God. But righteousness will deliver us from death. Now, without righteousness, we leave ourselves open to almost certain death. You know, righteousness is very closely tied to the belt of truth. And so righteousness and truth, when we walk in truth, we will be right. And so that aura that's around us, that spiritual protection of the righteousness of God, if we don't have that righteousness, if it's only our righteousness, the enemy is going to get in with a lethal blow. But with righteousness, the otherwise fatal attacks of the enemy are thwarted. They will not have the intended effect. Oh, the enemy wants to destroy us and kill us and wound us. But with God's righteousness, that will not happen. And the breastplate is always on duty. Now, just like the circle of the belt, we can't cut the belt, even take a little tiny piece out, because it will fall away. And then we are exposed. The breastplate is always there. So we're always resting in God's truth, and we're always resting in God's righteousness. We don't have to maintain truth, and we don't have to maintain righteousness. It is God's. And so we're not fabricating it. We're not making it. We don't have to make the argument. We just rust in God. And so that breastplate is always there. We may not see the attack of the enemy, but with the breastplate, when he strikes then he strikes the righteousness of God and not ours. So what is righteousness? Well, Psalm 119, verse 72. May my tongue sing of your word, for all your commands are righteous. So think about what you should do and how you should do it. The commands of the Lord are for a 
purpose. And that purpose comes to bear when you and I live our lives. So here we are sitting this evening, and we're thinking about what we should do, or where we should go, or how we should act, okay? With the commands of the Lord, our tongue is able to sing what we should do. You should always do the right thing. Now, to help us understand a concept, we sometimes look at what we call the antithesis, or the opposite of that. So the opposite of doing what is right is sin. And everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. And everyone, now when we say everyone who sins, we're saying everyone who continues to sin, you're continuing to break the law. You know that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. This is not to put you into condemnation because you have sinned. We are condemned condemned because we sin, but we are not thrown away. And we are we are admonished time and again in the word of the Lord that we should repent and to make it right with the Lord. Paul says that to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, come back to your senses as you ought and stop sinning, for there are some who are ignorant of God. And I say this to your shame. Now, the backdrop of 1 Corinthians 15, if if you have been following along with our Saturday school, then you will remember that the Corinthian church had a couple things that was going on. One of the things that was going on was that one of the men in the church had married his stepmother. And so, look at this verse. What does Paul say? Verse number 34. Come back to your senses as you ought and stop sinning. And he says, some of you are ignorant of God. And I say this to your shame. And so he addresses that. Come on, you shouldn't be doing that. And the second thing in the Corinthian church, there were many divisions in the church. And some were saying, I'm of Paul, and I'm of Peter, I'm of John, and I'm of Apollos. And and, uh, some were even... Uh, super righteous, I'm of Christ. And again, Paul says to them, come back to your senses. Is Christ divided? Stop sinning. And so he warns them to stop. So when we face with sin, what do we do? We stop sinning. We don't do it. To be righteous is to do what is right in God's eyes. Don't come and say, Pastor, is this the right thing to do? Now, that doesn't mean you can't ask for, you know, advice. Okay, you can always do that. But it's not whether it's right in my eyes or it's not right what you think is right in the church's eyes or the leadership. It's what's right in God's eyes. One time when I were children were younger, one of our kids said, Dad, we don't do this because the church says we can't do it, right? And I said, well, no, the church doesn't say this is right, that's wrong. It's not up to the church. It's what's right before the Lord. And so when we do or don't do, it should be as a result of what is right in God's eyes, not because the church is telling us to or not to, or the pastor is saying yes or no, or even because a parent is saying yes or no, but it's right in the eyes of the Lord. That is true righteousness. So question number six, as Paul Harvey says, turn the page, page number two. Sin separates us from God, causing him to withdraw his protection. So we're going to see some verses that clearly show this. Isaiah 59, 1. Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear. And so God, we can't ever get so far away from God that his arm can't reach out and save us. Nor can we, nor is his ear dull. You know, 
getting getting older, these ears are getting a little dull, and so I have to. What was that? You know, and and uh, can you speak up? And I I heard, I saw your lips moving, and I heard a noise, but I couldn't understand. Okay, uh, God's not like that. And uh, even when we are in sin and it separates from God, it, it's not that he can't save us or that he's not listening to us, but that he's withdrawn his protection. You know, as a, as a parent, there were times when, when our children were young that as they were you know, spreading their wings and, you know, kind of walking here and walking there and want to teach them to walk with dad, walk with mom, walk, walk with us. Don't get too far ahead. And uh, so there were times that, you know, we keep an eye on them, but they were kind of walking away and, you know, and, uh, you know, just to have them learn that they need to stay close to mom and dad, and sometimes let them get a little ways, and uh, all of a sudden they would realize that mom and dad wasn't there. And they were kind of afraid, you know, and, and that taught them a lesson that they need to stay close to dad. And that's what the, the Lord is watching out over us. And if we start to walk into sin, you know, he's still watching us. He still sees us. But his protection is not going to be there. Verse 2 of Isaiah 59 says, Your iniquities have separated you from God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear you. And again, now when we're talking that, that he will not hear, Notice it doesn't say that he cannot hear. It's that he will not hear and pay attention. In other words, if, if I'm walking in sin and uh, I, I can't say, Lord, I'm going to rob the bank over there and would you please help me to, to rob the bank and, and help me not to get caught? Well, I could say that, but you know, his, his, his face is not shining on that kind of activity. We cut ourselves off from God and his protection by continuing to walk in sin. Isaiah says God considers our righteousness as a breastplate. And so our righteousness surrounds us. Now remember, Paul drew this analogy from Isaiah at looking at that Roman soldier that was guarding him and his armor. Now, Paul continues, Isaiah 64, 6. All of us have become one, like one who is unclean, and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. Now, you remember in the Old Testament, uh, if people ate things that were, uh, they were not supposed to eat, God had a list of things and rules and regulations. Now, with that, God said, don't eat these things and I won't put these diseases on you, which was entirely uh, uh, wonderful because they didn't have medicine like we have today. And so by abstaining from those things, the Israelites were far healthier than the surrounding neighbors. And so they had foods and things that were unclean. They were not supposed to touch uh, things that were unclean. And so for them to be unclean, they couldn't come into the tabernacle, they couldn't come into the temple, they, they could not worship freely. Uh, there were all kinds of things by being unclean that separated them uh, from the congregation and it separated them from being able to worship the Lord. And so he likens that when we walk in our righteousness, our our righteousness is like filthy garments and one who is unclean so when we're like that we roll up like a leaf and our sins sweep us away with the wind but god's righteousness can deliver us from death jeremiah said this the days are coming declares the lord when i will raise up for david a righteous branch a king who will reign wisely and do what is right and just in the land. Now, Israel had gone into captivity not to come back, conquered by Assyria. Jeremiah is ministering to Judah. 
the southern kingdom. And they are under attack by the Babylonians. And Jeremiah says that they're coming. This is God's uh, punishment for us. But God is not abandoning us. God will raise up a righteous branch. And God did that in his son, Jesus Christ. Now notice here how explicit that Jeremiah is. He says that God will raise up David, a righteous branch. And we see that Jesus hailed from the city of Nazareth. And what does Nazareth mean? It means branch. And so it was a play on words that God brought Jesus, son of David, that righteous one from the city of Nazareth. In verse number six, he says, in his days Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. This is the name by which he will be called the Lord our righteous Savior. And what do we call Jesus today? The Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. What did the angel tell Mary that thou will call Jesus? He would call him Jesus, Emmanuel, for he will save his people from their sin. Question number eight. True righteousness comes from God, as distinguished from our righteousness. So this is question number eight, and we're going to look in Job 36. Job says, I get my knowledge from afar. I describe justice to my maker. So Job is saying, righteousness isn't coming from me. My knowledge, it comes from afar, or it comes from God. It comes from him, not from me. Be assured that my words are not false. One who has perfect knowledge is with you. So who has perfect knowledge? God. And that is why God's righteousness will guard us, because it is perfect. It is just, it is real. The psalmist wrote in Psalm 5, For you are not a God who is pleased with wickedness. With you, evil people are not welcome. He says, Lead me, Lord, in your righteousness because of my enemies. Make your way straight before me. And so the psalmist recognizes that if we're walking in righteousness, God's righteousness, and avoiding wickedness, we're doing what is right. God sees us, and God's going to protect us, and God's going to take care of us. And he says, Lord, lead me in your righteousness. In other words, Lord, show me uh, your righteousness, as what Psalm says, that thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So God's word goes before us. It shines on the direction that we should take. Now, Psalm 23. We looked at Psalm 23 a few weeks ago, and I'm sure that we'll look at it in the future. Psalm 23. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Now, you remember Psalm 23 is a psalm, and it's the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Now, think about this. He guides me along the right paths. So as a shepherd is leading his sheep, where is he leading them to? He wants them to go to pasture. He wants them to go to water. He does not want them to go to the cliff and walk off it. Okay? So the Lord knows the way that we should take, and he leads us in the right paths. And again, for righteousness, his name's sake. For God's righteousness. Psalm 24, 5. They will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God. So as we walk in God's righteousness, there is a blessing by doing the right thing. People around you, knowing that you do the right thing, that is a blessing from the Lord. And you can say all day long, I didn't do it, I didn't do it, I didn't do it. 
But when God shows forth that you are innocent, then how blessed that is. In Psalm 7, he says, the psalmist says, I will proclaim your righteous deeds. So what has God done that is right? In your life, he shows you the right path. When you do the right thing, oh, what a blessing it is. Think about your kids. When they do the right thing, and you didn't even tell them to do it, how does it make you feel? You can say, yep, that's my boy, that's my girl, okay? And you're happy about that. Paul wrote to the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians 5, 8, But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. Now we're going to talk more about the helmet in ensuing weeks, but again, we're looking at the breastplate. And so righteousness, doing the right thing, and then he continues to build the breastplate. The breastplate is put in place by faith. In other words, by faith, I accept God's righteous ways. By faith, I accept that doing the right thing is going to protect me. And by loving. In other words, Jesus said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all for everything that's in you. That's the first commandment. And the second one is like to it. Love your neighbor as yourself. So when we love God, we're also going to love his truth. We're going to love his righteousness. And that begins a circle around our waist of truth. And the breastplate makes a complete circle around our torso to protect us. He said, for God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. So in other words, walking in truth and walking in faith and love, that is going to keep us from wrath. You know that if, you're, uh, if, you, if you incur wrath against you, you're going to suffer. It's going to be painful. It's going to hurt. You're going to suffer loss. And so God didn't appoint us to suffer loss, but to be saved through Jesus. Now, Jesus died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Now, in this verse, uh, Paul is talking about two things. The first, whether we awake or sleep. In other words, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. And so whether we are awake, and like I'm awake now, or whether I do lay my head and go to sleep for the night, I can live in Christ. I don't have to be afraid. Or whether we are awake, alive, or whether we die, that we may live together with him. In other words, when I'm living here on earth, I live for Jesus. And if I'm living for Jesus here, that when I die, I will live with him forever. And then he says, therefore, encourage one another and build each other up. So, one of the things that I am doing this evening is I am hopefully building you up. So if you are listening to this tonight, you're watching me, then be encouraged today that as you hold on to the righteousness of the Lord, you're going to be encouraged, you're going to be lifted up. No, people are not always going to agree with the truth. People are not always going to agree with righteousness. But in the end, it's the only thing that will save us. Therefore, we encourage one another and we build each other up in the Lord. Now, question number 10. To the Galatians, Paul wrote, For through the Spirit we eagerly await, by faith, the righteousness for which we hope. So, we have a hope that the Spirit of the Lord is leading us in the right way in the path of righteousness. Now, we know that's right by the word of the Lord. We know it's right in our hearts to do the right thing, to treat people good, to watch what we say and where we go and what we do. 
all those things, those are righteous ways of living. And we do that by faith. And so we're holding on to that, that it has an eternal reward. Now, Paul wrote to them and said, for in Jesus Christ, there is neither circumcision nor uncircumcision. It doesn't have any value. Now, the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. So we put faith in the Lord Jesus Christ to forgive us of our sin, that God loved the world so much he gave his only begotten son. So the question number letter A, circumcision and uncircumcision, that has to do with the law. In other words, in the Old Testament, that was, the, that was a, a seal upon God's people. How did you know that you were a Jew? By men being circumcised. And so if they refused, they were, uh, they were put out from the kingdom of God. And so in the Old Testament, that was a way for them to separate the sheep from the goats, if you will. But Paul is telling them, now that Jesus Christ has died and shed his blood for us, the old things are passed away, the new things are here. So you can't trust in that old way anymore. You must trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, going way back to Adam, and this is where Adam, this is where Paul is tying this theme of righteousness together. Remember when God took Abram outside and said, look up at the sky, count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to Abraham, so shall your offspring be. And that God had made him a great promise that he was going to be a great nation. And Abraham believed the Lord and God credited it to him as righteousness. You see, Abraham, he thought that when God said that, that God was right, and he believed it. And Abraham was righteous before the Lord because he believed in what the Lord said. Have faith in the Lord today. Now, question number 11. Question number 11 is our last question this evening. How do I wear the breastplate of righteousness? Again, our lesson, therefore put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything, to stand. So, when this happens, when I walk God's way. In other words, I have the word of God I take the word of God into my heart, I let it shine on my path, and I walk the right way. Ezekiel, he said in Ezekiel 33, if I tell a righteous person that they will surely live, but then they trust in their righteousness and do evil, none of the righteous things that person has done will be remembered. They will die for the evil they have done. And so what he is saying there is just what Jesus gave us in the parable of the two sons. Here we, We'll talk about this in a second. Let's finish this, uh, verse 14. If I say to a wicked person, you will surely die. Now, notice what he's saying. To the righteous, he says, you're going to live. And to the wicked, you're going to die. We know that's true. But, they turn away from their sin and do what is just and right, that person will surely live. They will not die. So, in this, what Paul, uh, what, what Ezekiel was saying is what Jesus said in the parable of the two sons. Remember that Jesus gave us that parable, and in that parable, a father went to his two sons. He went to one son and he said, I want you to go and work in the vineyard. And the son said, okay, dad, I'll go do that. And he turned around and instead of going to work, he went off playing. He went to the other son and said, I want you to work in the vineyard. And he said, no way, I'm not going to do that. And he went away. But as he went away, well, you know, I, I really should go do what dad said. And he turned around and he went to work in the vineyard. And Jesus asked the question. Who was the one that did the will of the Father? Who was the one that was righteous in that? 
And they said the one that did, not the one that said. And so that's what Ezekiel is saying. Ezekiel is saying, you may say the right thing, but then go do the wrong thing. It's, you know, it's, it's not whether Ezekiel says you're a good person and you're righteous. No, it's what do you do? And so those actions took them away from the Lord. And so he says, none of the sins that that person has committed will be remembered against them. They have done what is just and right, and they will surely live. This is built upon the concept in Romans that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We don't earn the kingdom of God. But when we confess our sins and we turn away from our sin, then the just live by faith. Isaiah 32, 17, the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of that righteousness will be peace. Its effect will be quietness and confidence forever. The scripture says in, in Psalms, it says, I will lay me down and sleep. In other words, the fruit of that righteousness, God's righteousness, will be peace. We have peace in our heart because we have peace with God. If I have peace with God, nothing else matters. Oh, I know, we're going to be at odds with people here and always going to have things that are going on. But you have to learn to leave it in the hands of the Lord. So that's why it's important that we put on that belt of truth. And that's why we put on that breastplate of God's righteousness. Well, amen. I'm glad that you joined with us tonight for this lesson. And next week we will pick up lesson number four. Let's pray. Precious Lord, we thank you for this armor of God. It's not ours. It's not by our thoughts or minds or commitment. Lord, it's yours. So we put on your truth. We put on your righteousness. And when we put it on, we stand. So Lord, I pray for each one here today. I know that this pandemic is dragging on. We are almost a year now. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us. May this lesson be a source of strength and comfort to us as the days get weary. I pray that we would not become weary in well-doing. But may your, uh, your peace that comes from doing that which is right, may it flow into our hearts today. I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you tonight. And we hope to see you on Saturday at Saturday School at 10. God bless you.